hit with an uppercut of surprise higher interest rates his government said would never happen. How could he have been so irresponsible? The right honorable prime minister. Mr. Speaker, I know the Leader of the Opposition disagreed with us, but we chose to have Canadians' backs to the worst economic crisis of the pandemic uh, in uh, generations. Hey gang, what's up? Just Aaron right here, Question Period Canada. How y'all doing? Do you get confused sometimes? I do. Happens all the time. But when they're talking about Canada's debt, the Liberals say we're good, the Conservatives say we're bad. So sometimes I get confused, like, what are they talking about? How can they look at the same numbers and make them seem so different? This is a documentary that Pierre's team put together. Let's take a peek at it. Hopefully, it'll be able to explain a little more clearly what position are we in financially in Canada. Let's take a peek. To detonation. In episode one of Detonation, we learned that Canada's economy is more indebted than were many of the countries that suffered the worst debt crises of the last century, and how those crises caused massive human suffering. We learned the four indicators of a forthcoming debt crisis. One, sustained debt buildup, especially household debt. Two, asset price inflation. Three, falling output. And four, large current account deficits. Have these things happened in Canada? This is Debt Nation, Episode 2, Large Debt Buildups. Check it out. Let's start with the facts. The total debt owed by all Canadians today is $10.2 trillion. The question is, is that a lot? Debt is to an economy what a big backpack is to a man walking up a hill. It might be hard for a 100 pound man to carry his own weight on his back. Now, imagine him carrying 350 pounds or three and a half times his body weight. He can barely move and it won't be long before he collapses. That is like Canada's $2.86 trillion economy carrying around its $10.2 trillion debt. Sorry? The, the servicing costs on the debt that you're gonna have to carry, that you're, you're adding to now, right? Interest rates are at historic lows, Glenn. Uh, okay, but it's still a lot of money. No, 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 no. It's, it's still a lot that, of money. No, no, no. It our debt is three and a half times our economy. All debt crises have involved debt that in one fashion or another have become dangerously out of scale in relation to the underlying means of payment, said John Kenneth Galbraith. A nation is like a family, which must make all its debt payment out of its income. If a family's debt keeps increasing relative to its income, eventually the family will not be able to afford to make its monthly payments. A country's gross domestic product is the total value of all the goods and services produced by that country. Like a family's income, it is the country's means of making payments to service its debt. So. Has Canada's GDP kept up with its debt? No. From the start of 2015 to the middle of 2023, Canada's total public and private debt has grown from $7.9 trillion to $10.2 trillion, an increase of 28.5% while the real GDP grew 14.1%. That means more than a quarter of all the current debt appeared in the last eight years alone. But in that time, the GDP only grew half as fast. In other words, our debts are growing twice as fast as the incomes with which we pay those debts. When you look beyond just government debt, the problem is even worse. Total consumer, corporate, and government debt is 357% of our nation's GDP, basically the highest in 60 years, and more than 50% higher than the long-term average of 223%. How does that compare to the bubbles that led to major debt crises throughout history? Let's look around the world. In the immediate lead up to the Great Depression, total public and private debt was 125% of GDP in the United States. Remember the Greek debt crisis over a decade ago? Its economy burst after a debt bubble of 206% of GDP. Remember the subprime mortgage housing bubble in the United States that led to the massive 2008 financial crisis? Easy credit combined with the faulty assumption that home values would continue to rise led to excesses and bad decisions. Many borrowers took out loans larger than they could afford, 
assuming that they could sell or refinance their homes at a higher price later on. George the market Bush is not is functioning funny. properly, and major sectors of America's financial system are at risk of shutting down. That was 349% of GDP. Each of these debt bubbles led to massive economic crisis. The Great Depression ravaged the world for a decade. Stockbrokers jumped out of their office windows. People lined up on the street for food and lived in shanty towns called Hoovervilles after President Herbert Hoover. The Greek debt crisis led to pension cuts and a quarter of the entire workforce becoming unemployed. Overseas now to Greece, a country on the brink of collapse. All week, the banks closed, life savings locked up inside, with withdrawals limited to just $67. Heartbreaking scenes, like this retired man collapsing in tears after failing to get his wife's pension. The United States subprime mortgage crisis caused millions of people to lose their homes. Yet, each of these bubbles had lower debt to GDP ratios than Canada has now. These are the debt ratios just before the bubbles burst in the 48 most significant financial crises of the last century. Canada currently has a bigger debt ratio than all but three of them. In most of these crises, countries detonated when their debts were less than 300% of GDP. Canada's present debt ratio is higher than that right now. So what makes us immune from the same fate? Are we special? We may think we are, but we can be sure that every one of those other countries thought they were special too, until they weren't. So who owes all the money? Well, it is divided about evenly between business, government, and households. Let's start with government debt. In 2022, Statistics Canada reported that the gross debt for governments in Canada reached 102% of GDP. A commonly repeated falsehood is that Canada has the lowest debt to GDP in the G7. The International Monetary Fund's October 2023 fiscal monitor shows Canada's general government gross debt is 106% of GDP, higher than Germany and the United Kingdom, and virtually tied with France, all G7 countries. It is true that Canada has the lowest net debt to GDP ratio, a measure that deducts with the prodigious assets of the Canada Pension Plan, the I Quebec Pension know. Plan, and other government assets from the overall debt, without counting the pension liabilities for future retirees. By counting these pension plans against the debts, governments seem to be implying that they could use these funds to bail themselves out of a debt crisis. But pensioners would, rightly, fight such a raid and force politicians to back off. As such, gross debt is a better future measure. Worse still, reporting of the federal government's debt omits hundreds of billions of dollars of loans guaranteed by the government, which would become outright debt in the event of default. As an example, the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation guarantees about $898 billion in mortgage debt, much of which would fall on the backs of federal taxpayers if the housing bubble bursts. How did we get here? I know, I know, you're going to say COVID. COVID has become the dog ate my homework excuse for all government failures. But blaming the Trudeau government's debt addiction on COVID is not accurate. Sorry? First, the Trudeau government has run bigger than promised deficits in every year it has been in office, and it abandoned its promises to balance the budget by 2019, cap deficits at $10 billion, and continually reduce the debt to GDP ratio. It is worth repeating, the Liberal government let all of these fiscal anchors go before COVID-19. Other levels of government were just as irresponsible. The Liberal McGuinty Wynn government doubled Ontario's public debt between 2003 and 2014, long before COVID, even though only a few of those yearly deficits were justified by the 2008-9 global recession. Even during the COVID crisis, much of the Trudeau government's spending had nothing to do with the crisis and therefore cannot be blamed on COVID alone. The Parliamentary Budget Officer has concluded that 35.5% of the new spending the government added during COVID had nothing to do with COVID. Still, debts exploded during that time with a deficit of $328 billion in the year 2020-21, equal to 14.8% of Canada's GDP. 
the largest deficit ratio outside of World War II. Again, blaming COVID for the whole thing ignores that it was hardly the first crisis in history. The federal government's deficit as a percentage of GDP peaked at 9% in World War I, 6% in the Great Depression, and 4% in the Great Global Financial Crisis of 0809. In other words, the federal deficit in 2021 adjusted for inflation and the size of the economy was 64% bigger than it was in World War I. Two and a half times what it was during the Great Depression, and almost four times bigger than it was during the Great Global Financial Crisis. Only during the Second World War was the deficit bigger. In the years afterwards, the federal government in the 40s repaid this debt, running a record 5% of GDP surplus in 1947, just two years after the war ended, and the size of the economy almost tripled in real terms in the quarter century that followed. This staggering growth vaporized Canada's war debts. Our grandparents returned from the battlefields to the farm fields and factories, quickly paid off their war debts, and handed us the best standard of living the world has ever seen. That's right, they ran the biggest surpluses the country has ever seen, only two years after the war ended. We are now two years since COVID, and the Trudeau government's deficits are only growing. The federal government forecasts an additional $186 billion in deficit spending between now and 2029, and the Trudeau government has said it is on track to balance the budget in the year never. The commitment needs to be uh, a commitment to grow the economy and the budget will balance itself. Uh, now on to our companies. Not only do government debts exceed the size of our entire economy, the same is true for the corporate debt held by our businesses. And that was the case even before COVID struck. Even Canada's financial institutions like TD Economics were starting to worry as early as February 2020 before COVID-19. They reported that Canada's businesses had debts that equaled almost 120% of our entire GDP, which ranked the third highest among all G20 countries only behind China and France. The same report also indicated that debt payments were close to historic highs and, quote, a higher share of corporate income is going to servicing debts, even with what were at the time unusually low interest rates. What happens when interest rates return to their normal, long-term, historical average levels and these payments increase further? And since that 2020 report, things have not gotten much better. We still have corporate debt that equals 115% of our GDP, which puts us in the top five of the G20 countries and near an all-time record for Canada. This as debt is slowly rolling over into recently raised interest rates, which means higher payments for the businesses that employ our people and pay out dividends to our pension funds. That is a problem. In fact, the same families who work for these highly indebted companies and pay taxes to these highly indebted governments are themselves carrying record smashing debt burdens. Data from the Bank for International Settlements shows that household debt to GDP now stands at 103% of GDP, by far the highest of any G7 country and almost twice the G20 average. Even before COVID, we saw a glimpse of the danger of rising interest rates when the Bank of Canada raised its overnight lending rate between 2017 and 2018 to 1.75%, still a low level. This tiny increase in rates multiplied by a massive stock of debt required households spend 15% of their incomes on interest and principal payments, one of the highest on record. This caused a very large bump in the number of Canadians claiming insolvency because they could not pay their bills. Remember, this was all before COVID-19. Ironically, COVID emergency measures, such as plummeting interest rates, bill payment deferrals, cash supports, and large-scale bans on consumer spending for things like restaurants, may have given a temporary reprieve to the households that were beginning to go insolvent just before the pandemic hit. What is most astounding about this spike in insolvencies is how small were the interest rate increases that caused them. After rates began to rise in 2022, the number of insolvencies have increased even more, that is by 12% between 2021 
in 2022. So think of this. If tiny increases in rates before COVID led to a major bump in insolvencies, imagine what the very large increases that we have seen over the last eight months will do as people's debts roll over into higher and higher rates. Slowly but surely, massive household debts are renewing at higher rates and causing people to face ever higher monthly payments. Canadians currently devote 15.4% of their incomes to pay their debts, both interest and principal, according to TD Bank. For reference, just before the global financial crisis, Americans were spending 13.2% to service their debts. And that was what led to a massive economic crisis south of the border. In other words, our consumers are spending more on debt than were American consumers right before they blew up the world economy. The Dow tumbled more than 500 points after two pillars of the street tumbled over the weekend. Lehman Brothers, a 158-year-old firm, filed for bankruptcy. Worse, the burden of household debt is heavily concentrated among the poorest people. For example, in the spring of 2023, those aged 45 to 54 in the lowest income quintile, the bottom 20% of income earners, had debts equal to 732% of their disposable income, an increase of well over 300 percentage points since 2014. Even if some of these spikes are temporary, and where have we heard that before, the overall trend is ever greater household debt concentrated in the hands of the people who can least afford to pay it. How long before these people miss their payments, lose their homes, and go bankrupt? These older and poorer working families often have the most debt, the biggest wage losses, the worst career prospects, and the least amount of time to make up losses. The high cost of rents, I just couldn't afford an apartment. I couldn't afford anywhere to live. So, so I ended up buying a van and I now live in a van. And you have a full-time job? Yeah, I work full time at the hospital as a CCA. Rising debt for families also slows the economy. Evan Sedell, the president and chief executive officer of the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation said, quote, Canadians are among the world leaders in household debt. Pre-COVID, the ratio of gross debt to GDP for Canada was at 99%. These ratios are well in excess of the 80% threshold above which the Bank for International Settlements has shown that national debt intensifies the drag on GDP growth. We can all expect that insolvencies and bankruptcies will rise dramatically in 2024 as families just cannot pay the interest on their back-breaking debt, while that same debt weighs down the growth in incomes which which debt payments are made. A double whammy for families, businesses, and governments. To summarize. You'll forgive me if I don't think about monetary policy. Canada's debt to GDP ratio has smashed records over the last several years, is 50% higher than its long-term average, and much higher than was the case in many countries just before they went into a debt crisis. All of this proves beyond the doubt that Canada checks the box in the Reinhardt Rogoff test of sustained debt buildups, especially for households. This might sound like a lot of gloom and doom with no hope or way out, but think of the generation that came back from war in 1945. The generation had survived the Great Depression, had gone in their early 20s to fight and defeat Hitler, Mussolini and Imperial Japan. They came home exhausted, wounded and heartbroken from the loss of their fellow soldiers on the battlefields of the world. And they were deeply indebted, having paid for that war. And what did they do? Did they take a decade off while they borrowed money and lived off their grandchildren? No, they had protected their grandchildren's freedom and now it was time to protect their finances. They immediately got to work, they cut wasteful spending, they paid off all their debts, they tripled the size of our economy, and they handed over the greatest prosperity the world has ever seen, all before they were old enough to retire. If they could do that then, imagine what we can do now. With a common sense government that lives within its means, leaves more in your pocket and lets you get ahead. Where hard work is rewarded, where we make more and borrow less. That is common sense. Let's bring it home.
So gang, I hope that that video helps you understand the position that we're in financially here in Canada. It doesn't, by that video, seem very good. I don't know, you can make up your own mind, source your own material, let's figure this all out. But it doesn't sound good when I watch that piece. It, there's a lot of confirmation bias happening in my mind right now. My name's Aaron, this is Question Period Canada. We watch the daily broadcasts of the question periods live from the House of Commons. It's a great time. Come and join one of the live shows. It's a blast. You'll like the chat. That's it. We're learning about Canadian federal politics right here. So like, subscribe, get notified, and share this with somebody else that wants to learn what in the hell is going on in our country. How are we going to get out of this rut? We will, but my oh my, there's a challenge ahead. That's it. Thanks for watching. Catch you next video. Stay warm. Have something healthy to eat.